Hello and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener in Training, Tanisha Shade Spain. We've got some great questions, topics, and show and tells to get to tonight. So let's just jump in and get started and meet our wonderful panel of experts who are ready to share their knowledge and some show and tells with you of some things that they brought today. So let's go ahead and have you guys introduce yourselves. We'll start down here. Hi, my name is Marty Alanya. I'm a private landscaper, retired from several other plant related jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like my hands have been dirty my whole life. Jack of all trades, huh? Uh, boy, I'll tell you. All right, all right. <laughs> and next? I'm Ella Maxwell. I currently work in Peoria at Hare Nursery. I'm a horticulturist. I could answer most of your gardening questions, uh, perennials, shrubs, whatever it might be. Okay, and last but not least? Hi, I'm Karen Ruckel, and I work at Hare Nursery in Peoria, and I'm a horticulturist and have an interest in trees, shrubs, houseplants, and um, sometimes vegetables. Sometimes vegetables. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. wonderful. Okay, so let's jump right in. Marty is over here getting ready with her first show and tell. She yes. brought in a, what, what did you bring? And this is a Wajila. It's a newer variety called Maroon Swoon. It's got beautiful maroon flowers on it. But the reason I brought it in was because I wanted to do a little um, uh, pruning tutorial. So, because I see people do it wrong all the time and I'll bet you guys do too. I do, <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> so, here's a dead branch. Can you see that? That dead branch has to come off as low as you can get it. Right down there. And when you're pruning for shape and you have a branch that's just sticking out too far, when you cut it off, don't cut it up here. Don't leave that stub. I'll have to come to your house and shoot you, okay? <laughs> cut this off, cut it <laughs> down as low as you can get it, maybe eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch at the most, okay? Cut that off and then you don't, it doesn't show. And then, if you, there's one more little thing. If you're, um, if you're pruning for shape, somewhere. instead of taking the ends back, sometimes you can go down in the middle and when something's sticking up like this, instead of just cutting the head off, you can take it down here and cut it off. And you hide the cut and voila, that's not sticking out anymore. So you've always got some branches along the sidewalks that are grabbing you by the pants, especially if you planted roses or pyrocantha <laughs> and the thorns always get you. Okay, you can <laughs> reduce the size, you know, and you, you can head them back like that, but it's a better idea to drop crotch them, to cut them down in the middle and reduce the size. That way you get a lot more natural look. Please don't shear these. Again, I'll have to come to your house and spank you, okay? <laughs> don't, sh don't share these blooming flowers. These blooming plants, they, they go all summer in flushes, Wajila particularly, and I see people go, don't do that, don't do that. Just please, love them. Think of, think of your children. Would you cut their legs off? <laughs> don't do that. Okay, and sharp pruners. Sharp pruners are important. Well, folks, you heard it. <laughs> she gave you some pretty strict instructions on well, how to get this job done. What are you going to do? All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ella, you brought something in, too. Yes, I did. I brought some hydrangeas. These are the panicle hydrangeas that are blooming now. And um, I wanted to tell uh, our guests about the fact that these have a cone-shaped uh, flower head, but uh, they are also two different types of flowers on the panicle hydrangea. We have the sterile flower, which is um, has the petal, and then we also have these fertile flowers, and these are the ones that are visited by pollinators. And so you can see the the giant black. Um, wasp and a digger wasp and different things like that and these are also in tree forms so if you're wanting to encourage pollinators then plant the ones with the open panicles here but there are some like limelight here that have uh, a lot of almost exclusively the the fertile or the sterile flowers yeah, thanks. Good. <laughs> but anyway, these are the ones that you're not going to see the insects on. And so if this is next to your front door and you are you don't need to be afraid of insect pollinators, but if you are allergic, you might want to think about the ones with the um, full closed panicle rather than the ones with these kinds of uh, fertile flowers that the insects might be visiting. And uh, a lot of people don't think about that. And of course you can see how they age and all the panicle hydrangeas will get kind of a beautiful pink cast to them and they can be used as a dried flower. And 
I love the hydrangeas that are blooming right now. We had someone ask if you can split them and transplant them to other places. Is that an option? Uh, certainly in the spring, I think that you might be able to do that if they have multiple stems. It's very mm -hmm. common with the Annabelle uh, type hydrangeas, maybe not so much with the panicle ones, but I think you could give it a try in the spring. Okay, sure it's springtime. All right, and Karen, you brought something in too. Yes, I did. I brought, uh, this is a Kismet Red Purple Comb Flower. And this is going to be my new friend in my yard. That's what I call every plant that comes into my yard, my new friend. But the reason I liked this is I was a couple weeks ago down at the Missouri Botanical Garden. And I think right now is a great opportunity to go to your trial gardens, display gardens, or botanical mm -hmm. gardens and seeing what's actually still looking decent in a hot, dry, lousy year. Because I was really impressed. Uh, it was the variety, it was the uh, color raspberry that I saw down at the Missouri Botanic Garden. And I, I stopped and went wow and took a picture of the sign of what the variety was. So I, like I said, I, I think it's a good opportunity to, to see stuff of how it's going to look in your yard mm -hmm. and you know, withstanding harsh conditions that this year has had with the too much rain, not enough rain, heat. So um, next year I'll see how this is doing in my yard. Good opportunity to window shop and do some planning. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then you yeah. call Marty. Oh, <laughs> it's a beautiful color. I that love is. that. That's a really pretty color. And you said that there were, you guys were talking before the show about mm -hmm. a couple different varieties of the red. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, there, so, there are lots and lots of varieties of purple cone flowers. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. like Ella and I were talking about, we think some developers of plants have pushed them too quickly into the market, uh, and we don't see some of them wintering too well or lasting mm -hmm. too well after a couple seasons. Gotcha. Yeah. So I'm hopeful for this one that it'll just be beautiful. Your new friend. Yeah. yeah. All new friend. right. All right. Thank you. So today okay. we've got uh, a new segment that we're going to introduce to you today. It is called Other People's Gardens. And in our inaugural run, we went and visited Roxanne Sawhill at her house in Urbana. And let me tell you, this woman is the queen of maximizing space in her mm -hmm. yard. Take a look. Hello, and here we are hanging out in our Other People's Garden segment. And here today we're going to talk to Roxanne about her beautiful garden at her house. First of all, when we first pulled up, the biggest thing that I noticed was your incredible use of space. So if you could just explain a little bit about how you were able to get everything packed in here so tightly and kind of just the method behind your madness. Okay, well, so there's all these, there's cedar boxes here, and then I also have lots of pots. Um, I really like these fabric pots because um, they're reusable. Good and for drainage too, Really I'm great sure. for drainage. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of flowers in these this year. And then, um, you know, it's just every bed has several different um, types of plants in them. So like this one, I've got jalapenos, peanuts, calendula, Tulsi basil, eggplant, and zucchini. Um, the zucchini I planted kind of late because I knew that I could. It's something I think a lot of people don't know about gardening is that you can plant successively throughout mm -hmm. the summer and even into mm -hmm. the fall. Um, so you can have a fall garden, late summer garden. Mm -hmm. Like um, peas are a good example. Yeah. You can get that first spring harvest and then I think I'm gonna probably put some more on the ground maybe August yep. and get that, get that late fall. Yep. Um, is there any drawback or anything that you would have done differently or anything that you would have changed in your layout? Um, we may actually end up changing some of the layout because these two 4x4 boxes we started with are actually kind of breaking down. Overall, I feel really good about the use of space. Um, sometimes my partner Josh is like, why don't we plant more vegetables up where the flowers are? And I'm like, no, that is the flower bed. <laughs> <laughs> it must stay the flower bed. Yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, every year what's in each box kind of changes, but overall I feel really good about the use of space and how I can cram everything in. Another eye-catching uh, portion of your garden are your flowers here. So tell us what these are. So these are mostly zinnias here and some sunflowers. Um, behind there I've got some celosia and straw flower. Um, and Dumfrina. So there's a, those are all types of cut flowers. Um, so just for making uh, flower arrangements. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that you guys have built or repurposed or some sort of, 
you know, it's not everything. Everything doesn't have to be store bought and it doesn't have to be terribly expensive. I think right. that's another thing that kind of keeps people away. Yeah. You can build things from what you've got at home. Yep. I had some bamboo sticks and uh, some string and I was like, okay, I'm gonna make a support today. You yep. know, and it works. Yep. It works. Definitely. So, well, thank you so much for letting us stop by. This is, this is all great. And hopefully it inspired somebody out there uh, who, you know, if you don't have a lot of space, you can still make that work. Mm -hmm. Roxanne definitely proves that. So um, if you've got a garden or you know someone who's got a garden that we should see, send us an email and maybe we'll come check it out. But uh, for today, we want to thank Roxanne for letting us come out and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Told you she was able to cram a lot of things into a little bit of space. And if you want to see that story again or learn more about Roxanne's garden, uh, you can definitely find that story after the show online. All right, we're going to go to the phones. Looks like we're going to line two, I believe. We have a caller. Hi, are you there? Uh, Hi. It, What's your question? Are you, are you? I don't know if it's if it's me or not. I guess it is. It is. You're live. <laughs> oh. Is this Peggy? Okay, okay yes. Peggy. Okay, go I'm, ahead. I'm in Charleston. Um, I'm getting a lot of echo. Um, it's kind of confusing. Okay, I have a couple of uh, small um, hydrangeas. They're an older variety. They I bought them as white, and they've bloom, been blooming as white. But this year they're green. And they stay green. They have big, nice blooms, but the blooms are green. So I wonder if you have any insight into what's causing that. I'll hang up and I'll let you answer because I'm getting so much echo I can't even <laughs> hear myself. If you, phone. Peggy, if you want to stay on the line and turn your TV down, that works too. My but TV if you. Is is totally off. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> get your question answered. <laughs> okay then, ladies. <laughs> You want to weigh in on her hydrangea? It's probably an Annabelle type, and it should have white flowers. I'm not sure, but sometimes it. Do you think it's weather related, ladies? I I'm not. I've I see them green out, and then they they kind of persist. So right. So I don't know why hers wouldn't have had the white phase, though. That's kind of odd. I'm not it's I'm not sure why they wouldn't have opened. They they typically open white, and then they fade to. Lime green and then mm -hmm. pretty green and then they persist. They brown off and then they persist in right. winter. But I've never had I've never had anybody ask me why the petals weren't the right color at first. <laughs> well, and, and in the past we've had some Annabelles that that reverted to more the native looking, right, smooth hydrangea or mm -hmm. like some of my plants in the yard got mite damage to the mm. bloom heads. Yeah, I've never so, had that up either. So I, I would say her best bet would be to cut them back early next spring. Uh, they will bloom on the new wood, and you should get white flowers next year. I'm sorry that you didn't get them this year. All right, we'll try again next year yeah. for those. And you can, that, that's right. You, Ellie, you, like Ellie said, you can cut them right down. I mean, like three inches. Cut them <coughs> off. <laughs> You know, <laughs> start fresh. Yeah, don't cut them now because they'll start putting on new growth and it won't last through the winter. So cut them like uh, uh, Easter, cut them down, okay. and then they'll start putting new growth on. All right, we're going to go to line three. Belle has a tree too close to the house. Are you there? Yes, yes. Um, my uh, my daughter brought home this stick years ago, <laughs> and <laughs> for well, it was you know the National Arbor Day mm -hmm. handout to children. Yeah, and so you know we didn't have any real. You know, I said, well, go plant it. So she planted it. And we just had fun over the years, you know, recording her growth with the tree's growth. And mm -hmm. it is like 20 some years later. And the tree is now taller than the house. And it is too close to the house. Is there some way that I can cut the, it back and still maintain the tree? Or, you know, my husband says, no, we'll just have to dig out the tree and throw it away. And it's like, my, my daughter's tree. So, do you know how uh, old it is? My sentimental tree. Do you know what well, kind it is? Yeah, uh, it's yeah, more it's what about, kind. Yeah. Oh, what, do I know what kind of tree is it? Some kind of a pine tree. It's an evergreen. Okay. Yes, it's an evergreen. Okay, so it's obscuring windows and everything. Uh, actually, well, your husband is correct. Yeah, it's hitting. It's <laughs> hitting against the yeah. house. 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, the, the best thing to do is to take some pictures with it, record the memory, but uh, it, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to transplant it and you'll lose the, the desirable shape and you can just start over. I, it's you mean, unfortunate. Down my but tree? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that happens in life and uh, opportunity to to do something together and understand that plant material grows. Oh, another thing you can do, this is what we always did with our Christmas tree in our house, is my brother would take um, some cuts of the trunk and he made them into Christmas ornaments. So having, you there know, you having go. remembrances you can have, and then he did, um, That's a very nice idea. was it when you burn the wood? Wood burning. Wood burning mm -hmm. a design sure. on it and put yeah. in the year. I, yeah. I did so. one year make uh, little bears with different size <laughs> circles from <laughs> from my tree. You can you can use them at during the winter as or even like as a Christmas tree, but you're not going to be able to prune it and keep mm. it. It's only going mm. to get progressively worse. But you can plant another one farther away when she starts college. There you go. <laughs> Probably um, not the answer yeah. she wanted. No. Yeah. Yeah. If All it makes right. you feel better, I had the same thing happen. Somebody gave me a twig, and it's a, it was an oak, and we just didn't get around to digging it out and moving it over. And now it's I had to I had to whack it off. Goodbye, oak tree. <laughs> <laughs> nice knowing you. All right, Kelly. She has another question about a tree. What can we help you with? Kelly, are you there? Yes. Hi. I'm calling about my holly bush. I had three of them, but two died, and I want to replace them. They're uh, in a covered area, but it's a southern exposure, so they're, they're, they do pretty well. At what time can I plant them? Plant one right now. Yeah, as long as they're available in, in the marketplace and you can make a purchase, mm -hmm. uh, you can go ahead and plant them. And I'd recommend planting them earlier in the spring or even now, but not waiting until the end of September or October. I think for yeah. hollies, you want to get them established. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and depending on if, if you're more kind of north, like our Peoria area, we usually tell people the first year to use a, a product, an anti anti desiccant spray mm -hmm. to minimize the moisture loss because um, sometimes that first year can be a little rough on them. Yeah. But champagne's a little bit more warmer than, than us yeah. up in Peoria. And an anti desiccant is a, it comes in a spray can or a pump, usually a spray can. And you put that on the leaves before it gets really, really cold. Thanksgiving. And it helps keep them from drying out. Yeah, not when it's really warm after it starts to freeze at night. But you spray that on the leaves and it helps them not dry out in the winter winds. And make sure you mulch it and water it very well between now and freezing. Okay. They should much. do fine. All right. Charlie on six. Can you hear me? <laughs> You've yes, got a dying pine. Good, good evening, gardeners. <laughs> good I'm evening. a big fan of your show. Thank you. This evening I have a question about pine trees. We have a couple of pine trees in our front yard that are dying. They're dying from the ground up. They look dead. And we, we go around our neighborhood here in Sherman, Illinois. And we know a lot of other pine trees are dying too. It's not bagworms. I'm wondering if you had any advice. We think it might be something to do with the drought from years ago. Have you any idea what kind of tree it actually is. Is it actually a pine or is it a spruce or is it a fir? Well, that, that's a good That matters. <laughs> yeah. Good pines question, pines have long, like three to four inch long or longer uh, mm -hmm. little needles and they grow in a clump. In a bundle. Um, in a little bundle, yeah. Spruces and firs have more of a, a shorter needle. Prickly. And, and they're, yeah. Well, this yeah, spruces are spiky and fir firs are furry. Then. Yeah, so. it, it's a spruce, and unfortunately, it is weather-related that it has a disease. Yeah. It's a needle cast. It's caused by a fungus. Mm -hmm. It spreads in during wet springs to the new growth, and then by uh, later in the summer, last year's growth has been uh, totally infected, and those needles drop, and so you get a very thinned appearance, and uh, the best thing to do is to take those down. There are spruce 
that are resistant like the Norway spruce and there are other evergreen trees like white pines or um, some of the firs that would not have that problem. And the idea is, is that you make the determination today. We tell people uh, many times when they come in, if you don't like the look of it, it's very difficult, even with spraying uh, over a period of two years, to really bring it back into health. So it's not ever going to look better than it does today. So you decide <laughs> <Good point. laughs> if you want to take it down and uh, you can start over. A lot of times, uh, uh, they begin to deteriorate with age and also the fact that it becomes more shaded in some situations that the, the tree is not receiving uh, uh, full sun all the way around, uh, especially crowded windbreaks. It can just spread from tree to tree. Well, and, and, then, and then our summers of drought are stressing them further. A lot, True. yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so you've got some decisions to make. All right, we're going to go to two now. <coughs> Ursula has a question about tomatoes. Are you there? <coughs> Hello? Are, Ursula, are you there? I've got four tomato plants that started out all right and looked healthy, and I've got, uh, they're facing the east, they're underneath my uh, kitchen window on the outside. <coughs> outside, there's a little plot. Mm -hmm. And I've got chives out there, and I've got parsley out there, and I've got uh, basil <coughs> out there. Mm -hmm. But uh, the f tomato plants started out all right, and then all of a sudden they, even though we watered them and uh, miracle growed them, not every day, uh, you know, they would start wilting. But then we thought, well, maybe they were protecting themselves from the heat and from the heat of the house. And But then they perked up again, and we continued our regimen. And then all of a sudden there were brown parts on there, and then there were they just sort of like wilted away. And uh, <coughs> I, I I don't think we're going to be too thrilled with tomatoes, if any. The farmers market will be your your <laughs> choice now. <laughs> yeah. You know, tomatoes. Sometimes this was not a good tomato year for some people, and uh, you want to pick tomatoes that are. Um, hybrid tomatoes that are wilt resistant, maybe that's a problem that you're having. Uh, we recommend that you have them caged so that you can keep them up and have good air circulation around them. Uh, you want to have them mulched. Uh, you don't want to start them too early. And um, there are some fungal diseases, leaf spots that cause the lower leaves to um, shrivel and brown. Mm -hmm. You can hand pick those off. But normally the tomatoes can kind of grow out of it unless it's a systemic wilt uh, problem and that's from your soil. And you might want to try uh, a hybrid tomato next year. H had you had tomatoes in this place uh, for a number of years, that could be problematic too, that you need to rotate them to a new spot. Okay. Now we're going to skip to you because you've got another show and tell. Oh, I do. That you are going to bring. And while she's getting that ready, we've had a lot of people uh, call and write in about voles. So, Ella's okay. got your, <laughs> um, the fix. I, I do. Uh, I have a lot of hostas in my yard and voles are a, a rodent much the size of a mouse, but they feed all winter long. And that's primarily when they're problematic. And so what I did is I brought two different ways that you can dispense a bait, which would be to poison your moles. And then I also have another way uh, that wouldn't uh, necessarily do that because some people have brought me to task about what happens if the poison vole gets eaten by a yeah. raptor or a cat or something? But these <laughs> different bait stations allow uh, only the vole to enter and it helps to keep other um, animals from targeting the poison, but uh, you know, there it is. So this is a PVC pipe. It's a self-filling station here. You'd put a stake in the ground. You can just uh, attach it with a twist tie. And then the bowl can go in from either end. And you fill this cylinder with a uh, granular bait like a decon. And then you can put a piece of foil or a yogurt cup over the top. And this is usually recommended for during the winter when they're actively eating um, 
the roots the, off of your perennials. Yes. Yeah. What size is the tube? The, well, the tube can be pretty much any size because, you know, a cat's not going to get in there, a bird's not going to get in there. But a chipmunk could get in there, um, another mouse or whatever. The other one that works with the um, green square bait is you take a mason jar and you see that uh, it's a pint jar and you have the band and the lid and you just take a tin snip and take out a, a triangle and then you can put your little green block inside and then you can lay this then in your garden and it um, allows you to monitor this feeding. If you see that they're eating the bait, good. When they stop eating it, you can move it to another place. You can also take from a coat hanger a little wire to put it down because raccoons oh. like to roll them around. Mm -hmm. uh, they think they're getting something. Now, for the people that don't want to, you can take a, this is their thing, and you put two mouse traps back to back and they run in and die the end <laughs> <laughs> now that'll take care of that thank you baited so much ladies baited with we nothing, had a great show nothing. tonight okay. thank you so much just for joining us and that's all the time we have for this evening we'll see you next week good night